On this episode of Real Truth, we talk about the importance of teaching the Bible. Would that change if the Bible ever becomes illegal? Also, there is a lot of political division in our culture. Should we let that define our churches? Let's consider the truth about all of that up next. I want to start this episode with a real take. This segment where I give a biblical take on cultural opinions, events, or news. It is becoming more common in our modern day culture for the Bible to come under attack. There are movements to take Bibles out of schools and to erase anything remotely biblical from things like currency and government buildings. They base this on the idea of the separation of church and state. Even though this principle is not directly found in the Constitution, it is one that many people use to justify their position of removing Bibles. The Bible is also occasionally under attack from politicians. For example, Bill AB 2943 that was introduced in the California State Assembly on April 19, 2018, would have essentially made it illegal to preach or teach anything against homosexuality since that would be considered a form of conversion therapy. This would be included under advertising or in any way engaging in trying to change someone's sexual orientation to a therapy that was illegal under California consumer fraud law. This bill has since been shelved, but it is a good example to show that the culture wants to censor biblical opinions and potentially even make the Bible illegal. Thankfully, this bill did not pass, but that doesn't remove the sentiment from our culture. There are calls for preaching and teaching against homosexuality to be labeled as hate speech, so people could be fined or sued for doing so. It's not very prevalent in our society yet, but there have been examples of street preachers and evangelists who have been arrested for the way they have approached topics like homosexuality. There have been some high-profile occurrences of this in Canada and the UK. But it seems like only a matter of time before this is more common in the U.S. Even though the Constitution promises free speech, the now-defeated bill that was introduced in California and was initially approved by the State Assembly shows that there is a possibility the right to free speech might not be absolute. The Bible does not promise the right to free speech which is something I spoke on back in episode 18. Free speech is certainly a privilege, but since we have it, and many other freedoms based on biblical values, it is disappointing to see how they are under attack. With this gradual progression in our culture to attempt to center the Bible and Christians, it seems like only a matter of time until preaching from the Bible becomes illegal. That day has not yet come, but it very possibly may. There are many countries in which the ability to preach from God's Word has become restricted from a legal standpoint. Not to mention the countries that are hostile to Christians and have even banned the Bible. I'm looking at you, China and North Korea. In America, it is certainly not as bad as it could be, but we must be ready in the event that laws attempt to restrict the preaching of God's Word. So what should we do if it becomes illegal to preach certain things, or if the Bible becomes illegal? Well, thankfully, the Church has had to answer this question many times before. If it becomes illegal to preach the Bible in part or in whole, that should not stop us from sharing the truth. There was a time when the apostles were preaching in the synagogues, and because the Jewish leaders did not like it, they were arrested. 
We see part of this account in Acts 5, verses 17 to the first part of 21. The Bible says, But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him. That is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out, and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. In this passage, the apostles were arrested because they were preaching the gospel in the synagogues. Even though they were arrested, the Lord freed them from prison, and an angel of the Lord commanded them to speak the words of life. As a result, they went right to the temple and began to teach. They could have been discouraged like anyone could be if their message was rejected, and perhaps they were. But the angel made it clear that God didn't want this to keep them from teaching. When the Jewish officials alerted their escape, they had the apostles brought before them. Just look at Acts 5.27-29. And when they had brought them, they sent them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly God charge you not to teach in this name, yet you, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Even though they were commanded not to preach by the officials, they continued to do so even though it put them at great personal risk. It was more important for them to obey God instead of men. Several verses later, we are told that the apostles continued teaching and preaching. This is seen in Acts 5, verse 42. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They did not let the situation stop them. And this is a great example that we can learn from should the Bible ever become illegal in America. Even though men may create laws and restrictions that limit our preaching of God's word, it is more important for us to obey the commands of God to preach the gospel. In short, it should not stop us just like it did not stop the apostles. Even if it has the potential to bring us harm, this should be our mindset. Look at 1 Peter 3.17. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Even if we suffer for preaching the gospel, we are suffering for doing good. It is worth suffering for the gospel because of how capable it is to save the people who hear it. 1 Corinthians one twenty one says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. We also see in Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Even though it might seem foolish to the world, People are saved by the power of preaching the gospel. We should not be ashamed of this truth, even if it becomes legally complicated or dangerous to do so. No situation should make us ashamed of the power of the gospel that God uses to save those who believe. This makes it abundantly clear that preaching and teaching the gospel is necessary. It is necessary because it is the only way that people can hear what they need to be saved. Romans 10 verses 14 and 15 tells us this, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? 
and how it leads to feet, unless they are sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. The gospel is not preached unless someone is actively preaching. It doesn't matter if it becomes illegal to any degree. The gospel must be preached. How else are people to hear the gospel? We must stand firm no matter what lies ahead. 1 Timothy 4 verse 13 tells us, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Teaching and reading Scripture is something we should be devoted to no matter what circumstances we face. Even though the Bible is not illegal right now, we need to be committed to continue teaching and preaching the Word of God if it ever does happen. The commands of Scripture to preach do not stop when the world tells us to stop. Instead, we should be devoted to continuing to preach no matter what. Now it's time for Politics in Focus, where I present a biblical perspective on a political issue or opinion. Today, I want to address the political division that exists in our culture and even in our churches. This division sometimes comes from the fact that each political party calls the other evil or dangerous. A recent article from Jim Dennison on Christian Headlines pointed out many examples of this. Just look at some of these headlines. Vanity Fair wrote the article, Republicans appear to be realizing other candidates are dangerous weirdos. Or consider the, con the perspective of James Carville, who shared the opinion that even though Democrats are silly, Republicans are more of a problem because they are evil. From the other side, Sarah Palin recently said this in front of an audience. It's no longer Democrat versus Republican. This is all about control versus freedom. It's good versus evil. It's a spiritual battle. Bill O'Reilly recently said that Nancy Pelosi's actions show that she is an evil woman. This political division is further shown by the fact and over 40% of Democrats don't see Republicans as just opponents, but enemies. Likewise, 60% of Republicans feel the same way about Democrats. Pew Research recently shared the results of a study that shows that 72% of Republicans regard Democrats as more immoral, and 63% of Democrats say the same about Republicans. There are similar stats that show that each side thinks the other is more dishonest and close-minded than the other. Clearly, political division is increasing in our culture. But sadly, it is also increasing in our churches. Many Christians believe that they are right about politics and that anyone who disagrees is wrong. As a result, Christians allow politics to be a source of disunity in the church, and that should not be. There certainly are going to be disagreements about politics, even in the church, but that did not stop us from being united in our faith. Titus 3 verse 9 says, Let us wait for those controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law for they are unprofitable and worthless. There certainly have been foolish controversies, dissensions, and quarrels about political things in the church. But this verse tells us that arguing about such things is unprofitable and worthless. Now, I do think it is good to encourage believers to consider biblical principles in the politicians and politics they support. Sometimes, people get so wrapped up in their personal opinions about politics 
that they fail to consider who they vote for from a biblical perspective. If believers fail to do so, they should be challenged with gentleness and respect. Scripture should impact every area of our lives, including our political opinions. I also think that some Christians have a tendency to put their trust in politicians. They have bought into the opinions of their political party and feel like they must defend those opinions above all else. This impassions people to get fired up and confront those who might disagree without considering how they should treat other believers. Even though it is not the purpose of this video, the Bible gives us clear instructions on how to handle conflict that often get thrown out the window when the subject of politics comes up. People should not become so trusting of a political party that they fail to trust in God or His Word. Just the way some people argue about these things in the church shows that their allegiance is more with their political party than with the God who gave them salvation. Some people even act like the politicians they support are their savior. Jeremiah 17 verse 5 says this, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is a man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. His heart turns away from the Lord. We also see this in Psalm 146 verse 3. Let not your trust in princes in the Son of Man, in whom there is no salvation. These verses tell us that we need to be careful in trusting any man, including politicians, for strength and refuge. Because that is not where you find salvation. To trust in politics is to turn from the Lord. In addition to that, many politicians are not believers. It doesn't matter what side you support or what many politicians say, it is clear from many of their actions that many of them are not Christians. Since they are not believers, they are actually following their father, the devil. How do I know? Well, look at John 8, verse 44. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Politicians are going to lie, cheat, and do anything they can to get their way, because they desire to follow the will of the devil. This reveals the true enemy. If you are attacking other believers for their political opinions, they are not your enemy. The real enemy is Satan. Look at Ephesians 6 verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This makes it clear that it is a spiritual battle. We see a similar thought in 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Unbelievers have also been blinded to the truth of the gospel. So why do we trust them to lead our nation in integrity and truth? 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Even though Republicans say Democrats are evil, and Democrats say Republicans are evil, the truth of the matter is, any politician without Christ is evil by nature. So why do you keep trusting them? You could certainly support them with their policies, most closely in line with scripture, but that doesn't mean you should trust them. 
as discouraging as this might be. Remember that politicians are not where salvation is found. In speaking about Jesus, Acts 4.12 says this, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The Gospel of John 14 verse 6 Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Th these verses make it clear where salvation is found. Jesus is our Savior. The people of this world will disappoint us, whether it is politicians or others. But God will never disappoint. We can trust him. God is the one who gives politicians their authority, even the ones we disagree with politically. Daniel 2 verse 21 says, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Even when you vote, God is really the one who appoints our leaders, not you. This does not negate the votes you cast. It just means that God is sovereign over the process. I believe it is still very important for Christians to vote. Just know that God is ultimately the one in control of that process. I really like this statement from Jim Dennison. We can and should participate in our political process, but as salt and light rather than as divisive partisans. This is a good reminder for us to remember what our purpose is in this world. As tempting as it may be to argue about politics in church, that is not our job, and it is not very beneficial to the body of Christ either. It is our job to spread the truth and light of the gospel. We should not let political arguments get in the way of what God has called us to do. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. So we should treat each other as such, even when we disagree about things like politics. We must realize that even though we vote as American citizens, our true citizenship is in heaven. This is made clear in Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not belong to this world, so we must live as citizens of heaven, and not as citizens of the world. Despite political opinions, God wants us to value unity above our own interests. The Bible tells us that we're to have one mind, all because of what Christ has done in our lives. Let us not lose sight of this fact and seek to glorify God in all that we do, including how we approach politics. What would you do if the Bible became illegal? Is it helpful to remember a true purpose when political disagreements come up? Let me know down in the comments. Please remember to like this video, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Also follow us on social media and share this video. If you want to support this ministry, please consider donating. As always, thanks for watching, and until next time, walk in the truth.